those were hard years for me because I loved being a mother. I loved spending time with my children. But but when we would watch, you know, a movie where one of the characters was a writer, I would be like, that's not me anymore. Hi, welcome to Write Off, a podcast about writing rejection and how people get through it. It's been a subject close to my heart ever since I didn't manage to sell my own first novel last year, and if you're interested, you can hear more about that in the intro to the first episode in this series, or in the trailer. A quick admin point. Apologies if you couldn't find that first episode last week, which is an interview with Anna Hope. An Apple glitch meant it was hidden for some listeners. It should be there now, but if you can't find it, do contact me on Twitter and I'll send you the link. My guest this week is Catherine Heine, who, I'm happy to report, is just as funny in person as she is on the page. When I first approached Catherine for this podcast, she told me that she had 9 million insecurities, but rejection wasn't one of them. And I thought, okay, maybe she's not right for write-off. But then she kept writing back to me over the next couple of days, adding comments and caveats, and it became clear that in fact she did have plenty of things to say about rejection, just perhaps not the things that we all usually think of. In a way, that makes a lot of sense. Catherine had her first published short story, How to Give the Wrong Impression, about a woman secretly in love with her flatmate, published in The New Yorker when she was just 25 and had recently finished a writing master's at Columbia. She's since written a short story collection that is one of my favourites ever, Single Carefree Mellow, and two novels, Standard Deviation, a tender, hilarious book about a marriage and parenting, which came out in 2017 and which Kate Atkinson called A Marvel, and her latest recently released novel, Early Morning Riser, which is also incredibly funny, wise and warm. Catherine is very good at finding the comedy in everyday life. But there were nearly two decades between that precocious New Yorker success and the publication of Single Carefree Mellow. Catherine was in her 40s when she became a debut author under her own name, and they were not always easy years. Catherine and I talked about how she writes jokes, writing YA under a pseudonym in her 20s. She won't tell me what that pseudonym is, by the way what it felt like to take years off from writing to raise her children and the meanest knockbacks she's ever had. So here's Catherine. I actually worked for an agent reading the slush pile at that time. So um, when I look back on it, it's I like just remember myself with like sheaves of paper in my hands all the time. But I wrote it, I had a a story due for workshop on Monday and it was Friday and I had this other story that I was trying to make work and I couldn't make it work. And I met this woman in the elevator who lived in our building and we were talking about how the hot water kept going out. And she was saying that, she said, the guy I live with was in the shower today when it went, when the hot water went. And I was like, is it your boyfriend or your roommate? And she said, well, I wanted him to be my boyfriend, but we've worked through that. And that was Mm -hmm. like so fascinating to me. And the whole story sort of rolled out for me, like the way you would kick open a rolled up rug and you suddenly sort of see everything. Mm -hmm. And I began writing it that afternoon. And then my roommate and I went out for dinner and she told me that, um, a boyfriend in college had given her a framed poster of the four food groups and that that was the least romantic gift she'd ever gotten. And that just went straight into the story. And I finished it Monday and turned it in. I don't think I've ever written a story so quickly. So when you say you turned it in, what does that mean? You started submitting to magazines? Oh, no, I I turned it into workshop and then... Oh, so right. Sorry. Yeah. Workshop discussed it and I made some edits and then I start started submitting it to magazines and, you know, all the usual literary reviews and I got rejections, but that was okay because I never actually sold a story. So I was used to the rejections. And then and was submitting I, to magazines um, and journals, it, it, was that very much part of the course? Were your, all your peers doing that as well when they wrote short stories? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It was mm-hmm. just assumed that everybody did it. And Columbia also ran or produced, published its own literary magazine. So we were asked to 
solicit stories from our favorite authors and from friends and then they would then you would submit to other literary reviews I can't really describe like it wasn't really talked about except that everyone was doing it nobody really talked about the process or what your letter should look like it was just something that that happened sort mm -hmm. of like getting drunk on the weekends it was just kind <laughs> of a given that you were sending stuff out so you sent it out and then what happened? And then I got, um, I used to have a notebook that I kept in, you know, track of everything. And I was up to 31 rejections. And my friend Jennifer said, um, did the New Yorker reject it? And I was like, oh, I haven't sent to them. And she was like, why not? You're supposed to start <laughs> with them. And I was like, oh. So <laughs> I sent it to them on uh, Thursday. And they called the next day to accept it, which I didn't even know the mail worked that fast, let alone. <laughs> the, wow. New York. So it really was, you know, it was like an urban legend and it, it changed my life in mm. so many ways. So, Can I just rewind just a teeny bit to the less pleasurable part of that experience, which is the 31 rejections. Do you remember what they said and what, you know, was their feedback in there? Oh, none of them. No, there was one. All of them were form rejections, except one which said that I was indicative of what was wrong with MFA, MFA programs because <laughs> oh my goodness. I've really been taught to write, quote, prettily, but that I had nothing to say, which when I look back on that, I'm like, couldn't, couldn't the guy have just said, like, sorry, not for us. Like, did he have to put the whole weight of MFA programs? Wow. I tried to find that that rejection slip um, when my first book came out, and I, I must have thrown it away, but I do remember. But even that, I was just kind of like, okay, I guess my writing's not for this guy. Yeah, I mean, that is, that seems unnecessary. I feel like now is a good time, actually. I have written a little excerpt of um, that short story here with a question about whether you make yourself laugh, which you can answer or not. But I think I'll just read out a little bit of that short story. So as you mentioned, it's about a, a couple who, well, they're not really a couple. This, this woman is living with this guy and she sort of wants him to be her boyfriend, but it's all very unclear. <clears throat> this is the quote. For Christmas, you buy Boris a keychain. This is what you had always imagined you would give a boyfriend someday, a keychain with a key to your apartment. Only it's not exactly a parallel situation with Boris, of course, in that he's not your boyfriend and he already has a key to your apartment because he lives there. Okay, you admit it. There are no parallels other than that you are giving him a keychain. <laughs> I just find that really funny. And I think that is very indicative of your writing style, which I, I wouldn't say is too pretty I would say is is very sort of um I mean you you have a lot of anecdotes but in a way your writing style is quite sparse actually um I think it definitely was at that point in in my career during the weekend that I was writing the story a different friend stopped by and she had just come from buying her boyfriend a key to her apartment I mean, what it seems like, what are the odds of that happening? But she mm -hmm. showed it to me and, and then, you know, we had lunch or whatever and she went on her way and I thought, wow, the girl in my story would really like to do that. But how funny would that be if they were roommates? When you are writing that way, do you look for funny things or, or do funny things just sort of happen when you're writing? I think that I have a basic insecurity that if I'm not writing something funny, nobody's going to read it so I tend to write sort of from joke to joke and the serious stuff works its way in between um, oh, that's interesting but I do think also that things that are true are often funny just because they're true so and I think sometimes if you explore a joke like with a couple more sentences the way, you know, like she buys in the key and there are no parallels, but okay, there's this one parallel. So let's stick with what we have. I, I think things get funnier the more you examine them. Mm, 
Yeah. And and ordinary life is is often very funny, which comes out very much in the stuff you write. It's not extraordinary things, is it? It's it's mostly quite ordinary things. Yeah, I think so. And I've really missed that during during lockdown or the pandemic or 2020 or whatever, however we can refer to the whole past year. Like shortly before lockdown. I was at a dog park and a man told his, he gave his dog a 10 minute warning in a serious voice. He was just like, you know, Bruno, 10 more minutes and we're going. And that made me so happy, so thrilled with the world, so stimulated. I I can't even tell you. And I miss things like that so much. (laughs) Um, Okay, so it's 1992. And, you know, you're doing your MFA and uh, despite the guy who said you wrote too prettily, your story has just been published in The New Yorker. Um, So so did that open a lot of doors for you? I mean, you went on to publish more stories, but then your first short story collection, Single Carefree Mellow, which I really adored and which I want to talk about a bit more later, but that didn't come out until 2015. So, So there's quite a quite a big interim period there I wonder if you can talk me through a bit what was happening from kind of this quite precocious success at Columbia and then and then um the first the first short story collection that you published in in 2015. Sure um I wrote the story while I was at Columbia but it wasn't I did wasn't actually accepted until I was out of the program it was between it was, in, it was accepted the summer after my last year at Columbia. So it was like right out of the program. And okay. then it was, I did get a lot of agents calling me and that's how I found my first agent. And um, I didn't want to do a, a book of short stories that would have this one really strong story and then a lot that were not as strong. Also, mm-hmm. I wrote about unrequited love like a lot. I think that, that a lot of the stories would have been very similar. I just felt like it wasn't, I didn't want to do that. Mm. And then I needed to support myself. So I began writing YA novels and I could support myself, but I took all my time and all my creative energy. I had like really insane deadlines. I wrote 10 pages a day. How did Um, that come about? Um, after the story came out in the New Yorker, I had another story come up. I had, um, a story in 17 and a story in Sassy magazine, which I don't think exists anymore. And an editor saw those and called me and said, would you like to write YA for us? And I was like, no, I'm a serious writer. I don't write YA. And then we said goodbye and hung up. And I had just met my husband. He was my boyfriend then. And he was like, but you could stay home in your pajamas and do this, which is like always been my goals to like stay home in my pajamas. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. So I called him back, called the editor back and said, yeah, I would like to do it. And so I did that for about four years. And, um, and then I got married and had children and um, well, my poor <laughs> children, because in every interview I talk about how as soon as they were born, I had no more energy to write. And I'm sure they're just going to be like, you know, sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't think it wasn't a lack of time. It was really just a lack of, of creative energy. Mm. And those were hard years for me because I loved being a mother. I loved spending time with my children. But, but when we would watch, you know, a movie where one of the characters was a writer, I would be like, that's not me anymore. Um, and then when my youngest son started first grade and I had like those hours of the day back, I began writing again and, and it's still there waiting for you if you can pick it back up again. Um, because that was my biggest fear was that I have forgotten how to do it. And what did it feel like to pick it back up again? Um, it was, it was really exciting. It was really fun. I mean, having an idea for a story is such a 
such a joyful experience. And for me, it's like if the initial idea, then the other ideas come very rapidly. For suddenly I can see how to set it up. I don't always write it very rapidly, but usually the ideas for the structure and some of the jokes come pretty quickly. And, and were you first, when you started writing again, were you writing short stories? Or were you writing YA? Or what, what were you writing? What were the ideas that were coming? Well, I sort of decided, like, I've waited all these years. I haven't had a really great idea for a novel. I'm just, I'm going to be a short story writer. And once mm-hmm. I made that decision, this, the story ideas began coming very quickly. And then there were short stories that I wrote that I wanted to revisit those characters. And those are the stories that eventually became novels. Uh huh. That makes sense. And actually, even in your short story collection, you have characters um, who aren't necessarily the same character, I think, but Maya and Rhodes, they, they crop up in quite a few stories. So, yeah. so these, these short story characters have longevity in a different form, don't they? Yeah. Um, and, and like when I first started writing Standard Deviation, I was sending my agent stories that featured those characters. And she was like, this is great let me know when you have the next chapter. And I was like, um, don't call it a chapter. It's not a book. I can't write a book. Um, <laughs> is this the same don't... agent? Is it the same agent you'd had since, since How to Give the Wrong Impression was published? No. Did you have the same was... agent throughout? No, I, I switched agents before my first book. So it was my new agent who's incredibly wonderful. And she... I think that it was her saying like, well, here's the next chapter that that really made me realize it was a book, that mm. whatever I wanted to call it, it actually was a novel. It's so interesting. I mean, when, when you and I were initially setting up this interview and I asked you if you had anything to say about rejection, um, initially you said you said no <laughs> you said um, and then you kept on coming back with new thoughts on, on how you did have thoughts on rejection. That I think you said um, you said elves are not going to come in the night and publish something I've left in a drawer. And then you came back again and said, which is not to say I don't fear rejection because I do. It's just that the fear happens while I'm writing it. So the early self-doubt definitely applies to me. I fear not finishing more than I, more than I fear rejection. And I, I wonder how that played out when you started writing again. Um, how, how does that work for you? So you, you feel fear when you're writing, but you still like the fear of not finishing drives you on? Well, I, like when I start writing a story, I'm very excited about it. And I don't write chronologically. I just skip around and write the parts that are the most interesting to me. And during that initial, like first burst, I feel really bulletproof and like, it's going to be great. Even though there are stories I look back on now and I'm like, wow, I thought that was really great. How amazing is that? It's so bad. And then I go through when I'm about, I don't know, like three quarters of the way through, I always go through this crisis of confidence. And I tell my husband that it's a mess and it's never going to work and I should just scrap it. And he's like, you say that every single time. Like, why don't you just finish it and we'll see how it is. I'm like, oh, good idea. Like we have this conversation literally every time. Um, But there's always a place where I'm like, I can't make this work. I can't make it hang together. And then, but if you keep writing, eventually it gets done. So my, my real fear comes in that final push. And then once I'm done with it and I send it out, they're either going to like it or they're not. Like, I feel like I don't have a lot of control over it at that point. And it's so subjective also a writing teacher told me once that somebody asked when how do you know when you're ready to send something out or when a piece is ready and he said when you're sick of it and you can't revise it anymore and that's maybe the best writing advice I ever got it's way up there so there's a feeling of uh, it's such an accomplishment to have a story ready to send out and to send it to an editor that it's it's really to me it's an empowering feeling it's not a fearful feeling Mm. what do you think was going on when your agent was saying to you oh 
this is, you know, I'm looking forward to the next chapter and you're thinking, no, no, it's not a chapter. I'm not writing a novel. I can't write a novel. Was that right? Were you thinking I can't write a novel or is it just not how you saw yourself? Oh, I definitely, I thought it was something I couldn't do. I, I'm not quite sure why I thought that so strongly. Um, I actually started my writing life as a poet and I started in the poetry program at Columbia and then I transferred to fiction. But so I was just used to these very short forms. And I like when, when I wrote pieces that got longer, I tended to lose control of them. And I just, I felt very strongly that it was something I couldn't do. And then I mm -hmm. did it and it was so much fun. How long did it take you to write Standard Deviation, which, which is your first novel? How long did that take in total? Oh, um, maybe four or five years. Okay. But I was writing short stories in between there, too. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Um, a lot of your characters in your short stories and your novels are actually full of self-doubt. Although they, you know, your, your writing style is very, is very sort of confident and funny. The characters themselves are, are often sort of plagued by, by self-doubt. And obviously the, you know, the, the parents in standard deviation are, are sort of worried about how to parent their, their Asperger's child. And in one of my favorite of your short stories, that dance you do, which is about a mother throwing a, a birthday party for her child and sort of hating it. <laughs> it's very funny. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, at the, and at the end, she, she puts her child to bed and she's longing, longing to kind of get, get him to bed and then go and have rest or a glass of wine or whatever. And then she leaves the room and is immediately sort of desperate to hug him again or remembers how much she loves him, whatever. Which I, and I think with that very funny, tragic conflict is, is familiar to all parents. But yeah, there's a, there's a sort of element of like self-questioning and self-doubt that, that runs through all your characters very, very strongly, I think, which is a form of, um, I mean, self-doubt is, is a form of insecurity. Yeah. yeah. Would you describe yourself as, as insecure? Um, yes. And I think that sorry to keep blaming everything on the pandemic, but I think that the, the pandemic has made me even more anxious. I think I've always been an anxious person, but like the other day I drove somewhere and um, I went to park and there was a sign saying like no parking, but it wasn't, the date on the sign wasn't till like the next day. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I called my husband and said, do you think I can park here? And he just started laughing. He was like, I can't believe. He's like, how would I know this over the phone? You're going to have to make your own decision. I was like, oh, yeah. Um, I, I do think, I don't know. I mean, I do think the world is kind of a bewildering place. I think that I've figured it out now to a greater extent, but there's definitely, there's a story where in my collection, where the main character thinks that other people know things that she doesn't about like how to have your boiler serviced and how to have your, you know, which way the earth turns. And that is very autobiographical. I always feel like there's, there are huge pockets of things that I just haven't thought about that other people know. Also, after when my husband is my first reader, and when I gave him that story to read, he was like, Oh my God, we need to have the boiler serviced. I was like, Is that what you, is that your full feedback? <laughs> um, well, your husband is a Secret Service agent or was, right? An MI6 agent. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, does he sort of cast a very um, practical eye over? these sort of wry observations about existential questions and so on? Well, he is probably the least anxious person on the planet. So maybe we make a good pair that way. <laughs> um, but also I think because he's not a writer, he doesn't, he doesn't hoard his ideas. So I can always be like, 
what's something funny this character would say? What's something funny that could happen? Or, or how can I connect these two things? And he'll give me like three examples. And um, I, don't, I don't know if that would be the same if I were married to a writer. Are you married to a writer? No, I'm married to a lawyer. So I'm married to a very practical person who has completely different perspectives um, well, from see, me on things. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's pretty practical and very, um, very observant and, and sort of all the things that I am not. But I think you must be observant to, I mean, your, your characters, and, and, and I should say there are a lot of, there are a lot of characters in, in the things that you write. Um, they're all very colourful and fully formed with very particular mannerisms, very well observed. So I think, I think you must, I think you must observe things very well all the time. Well, I think I am observant. Maybe observant isn't the right word for my husband. I guess I would say switched on would be the... Okay. British term he's much more switched on than I am but yeah I think people are so quirky in general that that I don't think I could write a character who wasn't quirky because it would it wouldn't seem true to me when going back to your YA years I think you said you were doing that for about four years is that right although I think you also wrote a lot of books in that time is it, is it 20 yeah at least I can't okay. remember the exact thing but it's it's so that's, now. I mean, that's so prolific. Did, did you feel like a success, like a successful writer at that time? Um, I did. I definitely, I mean, it was really rewarding and it taught me so much in terms of the deadlines and discipline and outlining books and how like a deadline makes writers block fly away on wings like once you have to do something your brain starts helping you out it never ever occurred to me that I could say to my publisher like I don't think I can make this deadline can I have an extra week I I never thought of that I had these insane deadlines and I I met them all but I look back on that and I'm like wow I didn't really have to push myself into you know nervous collapse over every book I could have just said nobody can do this. Um, I mean, I wrote 10 pages a day, even on weekends. And if I skipped a day, I wrote 15 pages the next two days. Wow. Um, it was, it was intense. But it wasn't, it wasn't what you had intended to do with your writing life, right? So how did that, did you just assume and know that it was temporary or, um, and you did it under a pseudonym as well. So I'm, I'm sort of assuming that you were saving Catherine Heine for, you know, the books that you write now in some way. Did it feel different at the time? Well, it did feel really different because I was doing it under a pseudonym. And when I first started doing it, I was continuing other authors' works, other series. Mm -hmm. Like eventually I sort of got promoted and then I had my own series and I could control what was happening. And that was more satisfying. But it was also really freeing to be like, okay, I just have to continue this. Like it's all been set up for me. I can just sort of go in and write it and make it funny and add the things that I want to add. I, I can't really describe it, but it, it was definitely um, my husband, who was my boyfriend, then we just moved to England and I couldn't, this was the only job that I could have was set up as a freelance writer because of visas and all that stuff. So I don't know, I, I was very productive and I was making money. It really, it did make me happy in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important to make money. <laughs> and uh, I think people forget about that when you, when you write. I wonder whether you, whether that sort of gap, which in fact is, well, between The New Yorker and Single Carefree Mellow, I guess there was a gap of about 18 years. Is that right? 17 years. So that's 17 years of not writing the sort of adult stuff that you'd begun your career with. I wondered whether that had allowed any self-doubt to creep in. I mean, you mentioned your fear when you came back to it from having children, if you would watch a program with writers in it, that that would make you a wee bit sad. I, I wondered whether the, just the length of time in of itself before you had another crack, whether that allowed self-doubt or fear of rejection to creep in in some way. Oh, oh, sure. I mean, I was very afraid that I wouldn't be able to do it and that 
you know, my New Yorker story had just been a fluke. I also didn't have a lot of story ideas. It wasn't like I was keeping, you know, journals where I had all these ideas and I just didn't have time to write them. It was like, there were no ideas, no journals. I mean, I still read all the time, but I think the things that I read just kind of made me jealous rather than inspired. (laughs) Um, And then I'm trying to think back. I I think that one of the first stories I wrote was the story about the birthday party, which I started the day after my son's 10th birthday party. First in the second person, because I thought like fearing and dreading your child's birthday parties was, was a universal. And I'm not so sure that's true. Oh, but, I think it, um, I think it very much is. And I, I, I love the use of the second person. I think it's clever and unusual. No, I, I think, I think that feeling is, well, I hope it's pretty common. I certainly have it. <laughs> actually, one of my friends told me that um, she fears that her son will look back and on like his string of birthdays and just see her with like a really unpleasant face in all of them. (laughs) Um, I do find children's birthday parties. I found them very, very stressful. And this one, my son was having an origami party. Oh, I can't even remember. I can't even remember like the series of horrible things that happened, but I'm like, wow, I want to write a story about this. And then, and, and that was just sort of the start of doing it again. Mm, it's a really wonderful. it's a little more it's not a huge but I think a lot of writers when they when they talk about starting something it comes from a really little moment yes and I think it's reassuring um actually to hear that you weren't um keeping lots of journals throughout that time because I think there is perhaps a misconception that anyone who's a real writer you know is is compelled to do it at all times and that you know if they if they take a break extended or otherwise that that you know, negates their kind of writer's identity in some way. But but I, clearly that is not true. <laughs> oh, but I agree that that's very much the perception. And actually, I used to keep a journal in college. And then I looked back and I realized I only kept a journal when I was like lonely and depressed and had time to write in it. And that when I was happy and going out and writing stories that I didn't have time to write in the journal. So it was like, I really don't want to keep this journal of depressing thoughts. But that's when I stopped. <laughs> what has been the hardest part of your writing career? Oh, I think, um, I think it's a lot of, uh, maybe just the belief that, that if you, it's sort of the confidence in yourself but it's also the idea that and this is like the simplest thing in the world, but it was sort of, for me, the hardest part was learning like, wow, if I do even two pages every day, the manuscript will get longer. It will be finished eventually. Mm. That was a hard thing for me to learn. I think that I thought people who wrote novels wrote, uh, you know, a chapter a day or some bonkers thing where mm. really your every writer's output varies tremendously from day to day. Did you have writer friends who were doing that from Columbia or elsewhere? Well, I think that actually social media is, even though I love it and am addicted to it, I think it's people tend to put on social media, like when, when it's going well, they're locked out chapter 10 today. And I'm like, wow, I wrote a sentence and then deleted it. You know, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Um, I think I think that social media can make it feel like everybody's writing but you. And and I, I don't think that's the case. I think that even the most successful writers are, are, you know, there's just days where you don't have a rhythm. And the secret is sort of being like, okay, I don't have a rhythm today, but I'm going to work for two hours. And then I'm going to go clean the bathroom because it's actually a better use of my time. And then there are days where, where it's just like the golden touch or King Midas. And you're like, I suddenly see how to solve all these problems. So it's kind of looking at the overall picture or like in Alcoholics Anonymous, where they're like one day at a time. I think that can be applied to <laughs> right? <laughs> what was it like writing Early Morning Riser, which is is yeah really funny and warm book about? I suppose in some ways it's a romance, but I I found it very much a, a kind of story of um of just sort of how life works and how it kind of happens without really noticing. But what was it yeah. like writing that after the 
success of standard deviation did you feel pressure to sort of replicate that same success or that same style well it was hard for me to start start writing again after because and this is something nobody t- ever told me is that like the, the further you get into the book the more real the characters become and it becomes so much easier to write about them so when I finished standard deviation, like Graham and Audra and Matthew were super real to me. I knew what they would say in any situation. And then suddenly trying to like develop this new group of people, I was like, wow, this is really hard. So I worked on it sort of sporadically for a year. And then I wrote to my agent and said, okay, I'm going to turn it in by July 4th. And I'm like, I don't expect you to read it July 4th. This is just like, I need the deadline. So we're going to do this. So she was like, great. I'll wait to hear from you on July 4th. She's so cool. She's so laid back. Um, (laughs) And then I began writing and writing is really, it's like a train gathering speed. It's like in the beginning, it's hard and the wheels turn slowly. But then like the last half of the book, I wrote it so quickly and I worked such long hours but it was it was really really fun I mean it was still work but it was fun yeah that's great to hear do you think that comic writing is taken seriously enough yeah although it's interesting because like I don't know whether British writers are funnier than American ones in general but so many of my favorite British writers are really really funny like David Nichols and Carnby and Helen Fielding. Um, I did get a rejection letter once on a story where the editor said, everybody here has read it and we all laughed out loud, but we decided it wasn't for us. And I remember being like, do you know how hard it is to make someone laugh out loud? Like, wouldn't that make you take the story? (laughs) That is strange. Um, No further explanation. No, no. No. Um, So yeah, I think it is sometimes taken less seriously. I think it's one of the hardest, hardest things to do. Although, well, there's that quote about like, the hardest writing makes the easiest reading. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that but I think that applies to anybody who's who's writing is doing a fantastic job. Like I'm, you know, thrillers and any book that that reads easily is probably the result of really hard writing. Mm. And I guess so many of my favorite books are comic, are literary novels with a comic side to them that it never occurred to me that it wouldn't, that that wasn't uh, the greatest goal in the world to write a comic book. (laughs) I sort of dislike the term light. Like, Mm. what does that even mean? It does sound very derogatory. Mm. Um, whereas heavy doesn't sound great. That's not something (laughs) I would want to be either. So yeah, I think, I think that possibly the adjectives used to describe a comic novel that has, is funny. They tend to be not, not great adjectives. Whereas, you know, if a novel is very serious and well done, then you can say it was brilliant and haunting and lyrical and you know, I, I just think it's maybe comes down to adjectives. <laughs> well, that is a very funny way of being derogatory about people who are derogatory about comic writing. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to Write Off. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if you do have a chance to leave a review or rating, I'd really appreciate it. You can do that in your podcast app and it really helps people find the podcast. Plus, it just makes me feel good, to be honest. Guests still to come on the podcast include Julian Fellows, Anne Napolitano, Alex Wheatle, Michelle Roberts, Harry Parker, Phoebe Morgan and Douglas Stewart. You can also find me on Twitter. I'm at Francesca Steele with an E at the end. So do pop along and say hello. Um, Hope to see you there. Bye.